This exhibition, Artists of Mexico, is presented as our summer exhibition in advance of the Getty's endeavor entitled Pacific Standard Time, La La, parenthetically, Los Angeles, Latin America. I think that Pacific Standard Time is going to be a remarkable opportunity to see a fantastic tapestry of exhibitions that covers so much territory and in presenting our exhibition it seems to me that the one territory that is less acknowledged is the remarkable history, the actual history of Los Angeles and Latin America. Very specifically, Mexico. Los Angeles was part of Mexico until 1848. It isn't some abstract concept, it's not conceptual, it's actual. And artists have found great exotic and cultural riches in Mexico, and Mexican artists have found the same in Los Angeles and all of Southern California, and California in general, the entirety of California. Uh, artists such as Diego Rivera never created murals in Los Angeles, but he did in San Francisco, several in fact. On the other hand, Los Angeles figures very significantly in the history of Diego Rivera. And what unfolds in this exhibition is the very element that I find personally odd in its absence in Pacific Standard Time. Perhaps that's caused by the museum's feeling that that history has been told time and again. Indeed, LACMA has done some remarkable exhibitions over the years, keying on aspects of Mexican art, for example. But never has there been an exhibition that specifically connects those artists to Los Angeles and connects Los Angeles artists to Mexico. It, we are interlinked, we are better for it, and as we speak about walls separating our nations today, what we realize is that we've always been part of a constant dialogue. And this is an exciting exhibition for me as it has unfolded in the process of its creation. This exhibition keys upon 10 artists of Mexico. What becomes evident in placing these select works on our walls next to very brief biographies of those artists is that their lives were critically interlinked with LA. Here we have a small fresco, actually a fresco painted on plaster cement by Alfredo Ramos Martinez. Alfredo Ramos Martinez was a, perhaps the least known of the Mexican muralists and perhaps one of the most important. He literally established the open air school which gave voice to Diego Rivera, Orozco and Siqueiros, who we all know as the great masters of the Mexican mural. Alfredo Ramos Martinez came to Los Angeles, had to leave Mexico in around 1929, 1930, due to the illness of a daughter seeking medical care for her here in LA. In Los Angeles, he established himself with some great difficulty having exhibitions here very early on. Indeed, there are frescoes, murals of Ramos Martinez from Santa Barbara all the way down to San Diego. And Scripps College has a brilliant mural that can be seen. So our history is so interlinked with these Mexican muralists. This particular work is actually a smaller version of a monumental scale wall that uh, Ramos Martinez did, which I was privileged to exhibit some years ago here in this gallery. Pleased to say that that wall is now in the public collection in Coronado in the San Diego area. But Ramos Martinez is an example of an artist whose very reputation was catapulted from Los Angeles with important exhibitions to finally be reintroduced in a dramatic way in Mexico itself. And today, Ramos Martinez is one of the most sought after and desired artists of the Mexican modern period. Here we have a fabulous drawing by Ramos Martinez where you can see 
how he has drawn on the local newspaper, this being the Los Angeles Times, dated September 6, 1933. It's worth having this work just to be able to read these classifieds. <laughs> it's really quite amusing. But the poignancy of these figures and, and the effect on the contemporary journal of the day has a certain sort of uh, connection between Los Angeles and Mexico that's very special. Um, Ramos Martinez began this process actually when he was working in Paris, didn't have paper and just started working on the local journal. But it's a wonderful drawing that dates from 1933. Jean Charlot, born in Paris in the late 19th century, came to Mexico and there became associated with the muralists and did some fantastic murals in Mexico. But his history with Los Angeles is rather pronounced in that he was a consequential printmaker and had an association with Los Angeles's most significant printer of the 1930s and 40s, and that's uh, Linton Kistler. And in LA, Charlot even taught at the Chouinard Art School. So the linkage between Mexico and Los Angeles is again underscored here in a very direct manner. Children figured prominently in um, Charlot's work and this wonderful work from the early 30s. But we also see in the other painting a very favored imagery and that is of the mother and child. Many of which come from even religious paintings because that's where he got his beginnings in Paris as a religious painter. Here we see a very beautiful drawing of this textile weaver by Diego Rivera, who was the greatest of the muralists and the most important painter of that epoch for Mexico. And what's so interesting about Diego Rivera's connections to Los Angeles, which is seldom discussed, is an interesting anecdote where during this period of the late 40s, for example, this, this drawing being from 1934, but in the 40s, Rivera became the target of censorship doing, due to his communist leanings. And the works were not well received. Uh, murals were defaced and whitewashed. But Los Angeles, with a kind of progressive community, the film world in particular, the Hollywood elite who collected Diego Rivera, interestingly, there's one particular painting by Rivera showing a flower carrier that is used in the background of films. What's interesting is the same painting was included in the background scenes of five different films. Now one might think that that would have been because of convenience, maybe owned by the director or the studio or something to that effect, but in fact that single painting used in five films was placed there in five different productions of different studios and the people behind those films were different as well. So this was Hollywood in a sense poking their finger in the eye of those forces of censorship who essentially grew into the era of McCarthyism. Another artist related to the Mexican muralist was Gustavo Montoya. And again, Los Angeles figures so prominently. 1928, Gustavo Montoya comes to Hollywood to work for a Hollywood film company to create movie posters. In Los Angeles, he had his very first exhibition ever at a, the Durand Gallery, a very little known and recognized gallery today. But Gustavo Montoya had its origins, had his origins in Los Angeles. 
An artist of unique distinction is Francisco Zuniga, thought by many to be the great sculptor of Latin America of the 20th century. Unique in the sense that both his nation, Costa Rica, his nation of birth, Costa Rica, and Mexico, where he went in 1936, claim him as their own. And Zuniga has to be regarded uniquely in the history of Mexico for so many reasons, but he has become so much part of the landscape that his provocative depictions of the indigenous woman have been somehow normalized in an era where the very act of celebrating the Indian woman as the earth mother, this source of power and tremendous connection to to our, our families, our culture, has been almost lost. We see in this beautiful sculpture, a very rare wood sculpture by Zuniga, the amazing abstract qualities of Zuniga. In virtually every direction, there's a harmony that is so remarkable. There's a poignant quality to these works that are so connected to both abstract and figuration. And we see the genius of Zuniga carried through with the figure ground relationship of his drawings and even in his very little known paintings. Zuniga came to Mexico with letters of recommendation to be a painter, but in fact, there was such demand upon him that sculpture occupied his interests and talents from the 60s on exclusively. Los Angeles figured significantly in Zuniga's works because perhaps his greatest numbers of collectors hailed from this part of the country. His sculptures, monumental sculptures, can be found in institutions throughout California, from San Francisco to Santa Barbara Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum, UCLA Sculpture Gardens, San Diego Museum, etc., etc., University of Southern California. And perhaps one of the most celebrated and most revered works is in the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. So Zuniga holds this kind of remarkable internationalism. People come here and wonder, Asian people come here and asking, is he Asian? People of African descent come here and say, there's something about his works that are reminiscent of the African figure. Eastern Europeans have said the same. And so what we see in this work is something so universal and we understand why Zuniga was so widely collected and indeed was the most widely collected artist of Mexico outside of Mexico. We see in this very rare painting by Zuniga from 1934, created two years before he goes to Mexico, this painted in Costa Rica entitled Chola. We see the connection and why he would have been so well received and embraced in the Mexican artistic community. We see the virtuosity of Francisco Zuniga in these remarkable drawings. The sensuality is always monumental. It doesn't resort to something tawdry, no matter how provocative the pose. It's sensuality, not for the sake of eroticism, but for the sake of monumentality. The dignity of these figures, the knowing appearance of these figures are so astounding. They could be absolutely from any period. There's a timelessness, and yet with Zuniga's drawings, we know these are Mexican figures. Their attire often reveals the region in which they were. Could a work be more revealing and more dignified and elegant? The figure reveals herself, not just physically, but there's a remarkable sensitivity that the artist conveys here. I think this is truly a masterful work. Here we see the works of David Alfaro Siqueiros. And Siqueiros is one of those incredibly 
complex painters in terms of his history, very much in, as was Diego Rivera because of his politically charged views and, and uh, imprisonments and whatnot. But we see in these works the relationship to American painting, really. Siqueiros worked with Jackson Pollock. Pollock was his assistant in New York for a short time. But in Los Angeles, where Pollock, in fact, originated from, went to high school here, Manual Arts High School. In Los Angeles, Siqueiros painted several murals, one of which was in Elvera Street, ultimately whitewashed because the owners of Elvera Street were not very sympathetic to this provocative political statement, not really conducive to the kind of commercialism that one hoped to achieve in this tourist commercial area. The painting was whitewashed, and due to the painting, and it was forgotten, but uh, due to the painting flaking off, it suddenly revealed this lost mural, and some years ago went through a great restoration to reintroduce itself to the Los Angeles public. The same thing happened at Chenard School of Art, where he painted a mural there as well. So Segueras' history in Los Angeles is significant. It has been rediscovered in a sense, and we're the better for it. During the period that Siqueiros painted the murals in Los Angeles, he also had a couple of exhibitions. One was at the uh, famous Jake Zeitlin's bookstore and gallery. Zeitlin re actually exhibited a great many of the early moderns and a number of the Mexican artists. The other gallery that Siqueiros exhibited was the same gallery that represented uh, Alfredo Ramos Martinez, and that was the Dazzled Hatfield Gallery that was located in the Ambassador Hotel, which of course was famous for being the home of the Coconut Grove, no longer existing. But these were monumentally important venues that are spoken about too little in the Los Angeles tapestry of art history. Rufino Tamayo, of course, was quite removed from the Mexican muralists, seeking more from the surrealists, in fact, but also melding that with a pre-Columbian uh, mysticism, this sort of um, otherworldly quality of the figures of the pre-Columbian objects. But Tamayo had special engagement with Los Angeles. He worked here in Los Angeles, creating original lithographs with June Wayne, a famous tamarind print studio. So in this case, this is a work part of the Mexican master's portfolio of original lithographs, which included uh, artists that we've talked about, such as Siqueiros and uh, Zuniga and uh, Cuevas and others. But here we see an artist whose connections to Los Angeles also were by way of knowing Los Angeles artists. He was deeply moved by the works of Hans Burkhardt, who is one of Los Angeles' greatest modernists and became a lifelong admirer of Burkhardt. They met in Mexico, they revisited in Los Angeles on more than one occasion. The last time Burkhardt and Tamayo met was when California State University Northridge honored Tamayo here in Los Angeles. Also in 1975, the Los Angeles County Museum commissioned Rufino Tamayo to do an original lithograph for the membership of the Graphic Arts Council. Francisco Zuniga also had that distinction a year or two earlier. So these connections between Los Angeles and these major artists of Mexico continue to repeat and repeat and repeat and it is critical that Los Angeles not be the last to know. Rafael Coronel has a certain linkage to Los Angeles that's a bit different than many of these artists. It comes less so by way of his biography here, but more so by way of being introduced here by 
the galleries that represented him. B. Lewin Gallery, whose collection is now housed at the Los Angeles County Museum, championed Raphael Coronel, whose works are more recognizable with these very um, romantic images of uh, cardinals and single figures, peasants and what have you, always in this rather austere landscape. Here, this work by the son-in-law of Diego Rivera and the brother of the other famous Mexican painter, Pedro Coronel, this work shows an earlier period in Coronel where we see a more expressionist sensibility. We can imagine him looking at the works, for example, of Francis Bacon. But we see Los Angeles being integral to his broadening reputation. These images of Frida Kahlo must surely rank as perhaps the most intimate photographs ever taken of Frida. They're photographs by Bernice Colco, a very close friend of Frida's and Diego Rivera. And Colco had quite formidable roots here in Los Angeles. She worked here at Lockheed Aircraft for the war effort in the late 40s before joining the Women's Army Corps as a photographer. In the 40s, Coco attended Art Center School in Los Angeles. She later attended Los Angeles City College, studying commercial photography, and pursued experimental techniques as well, and was closely associated with Man Ray. In Mexico, Bernice created a remarkable body of work titled The Faces of Mexico. And these photographs of all the artists of Mexico have been shown internationally. Jack Rutberg Fine Arts had, in 2005, had the honor of being the first venue to exhibit the images of Frida Kahlo by Bernice Colco. A short time later, on the centennial of Bernice Colco, the Frida Kahlo Museum in Mexico City devoted an entire exhibition to Bernice Colco where they were shown for the first time in a museum. So we see here again the remarkable connections to Los Angeles and Mexico. Here we have a rather extraordinary and unique work by Jose Luis Cuevas. Cuevas is another example of an artist coming to Los Angeles, working again with June Wayne at the Tamarin Institute, the legendary June Wayne, a remarkable printmaker in, in her own right, who essentially re-energized printmaking in America. Cuevas was championed, and I can remember in the 70s, early 70s, going to the Sylvan Simone Gallery, seeing these remarkable drawings by this artist who became known as the L'Enfant Terrible of Mexico because he had offended virtually everyone in Mexico by insulting Mexican art, wanting desperately to remove himself from that tradition and saw himself more aligned with the works of Goya and Picasso and the like. He was re-embraced in Mexico ultimately later in years and sadly just days before this filming passed away at the age of 83. But Cuevas, very much like Rafael Coronel and Montoya, these are artists that were championed by gallerists in Los Angeles. And we can't forget the role of the gallery to initiate and stimulate a public awareness of these artists. It's not the museums that have done that any more than they did for Van Gogh. So that process of visiting a gallery and ex being exposed to these artists over a period of time and essentially launching careers internationally in the case of the artists in this show, Los Angeles and the galleries of Los Angeles had more to do with that than any institution internationally. In presenting this exhibition as a prelude to Pacific Standard Time, to which we will be participating in a very focused manner by presenting Hans Burkhardt in Mexico in the decade that he was there, followed by 
Rico Lebrun, another extraordinary Los Angeles artist who had a huge impact in Mexico. And then also a very big surprise with George Romero, infamous, famous filmmaker and George Nama in collaboration in creating a body of work for the gallery here. And then an exhibition of Francisco Zuniga, Indigenous Beauty. These will be presented, but this prelude exhibition hopefully can show what one can do merely looking at art and contextualizing it. If a gallery can do this thematic exhibition merely from its holdings, imagine what a museum can do with its resources to tell a history that we're all deeply in need of being reintroduced to.